time to start. I am very pleased to present to you uh, Dr. Brian Keyes from the Asabel Institute. As promised, he is here to tell us all the wonderful things that go on up there. Um, I've heard a lot of great things today, a lot of great things from students who have been there, and I know some of you have also expressed the desire to check it out. So, uh, without any further ado, here's Thank you. Well, thanks for having me tonight on this beautiful fall day. I appreciate the cooler weather from what's been going on. This is more like my neck of the woods, which is northern uh, lower Michigan. Uh, so I'm down here visiting, um, getting to meet some of the students and others that may be interested in El uh, And from what I understand, this seminar is to uh, have you hear some about possible careers and ideas in uh, biology. Um, again, I'm with the El Salvador Institute of Environmental Studies. So my primary area, I guess you would say, is environmental biology, environmental studies, environmental science. Um, but as you'll see when we go through this, um, I've done a lot more. Uh, I've had a number of experiences that I, I will share just very briefly with you at, at different points. Um, but mostly, I'm excited to be able to share with you because, for what I understand, all of you have been here for about five weeks. Is that correct? How is college going? Good. Are you like over the shock of being away from home, of being able maybe to sleep in? I don't know. Do you have an eight o'clock class? Um, stay up late at night, take naps. I mean, it's, it's very different than high school, right? So it takes an adjustment, and hopefully you're getting through that. Um, I, uh, I have a, a freshman and a sophomore of my own in college, so they're in that situation. Um, I am fairly old. If I have to read something, I'll have to put on glasses, but if I have them on, you're blurry, so I'll keep them off. But I can remember college just about like it was yesterday. I love college. Um, it helped turn me on. Uh, to what I'm doing today and why I'm here. So I'm excited to be here uh, to share with you. I will present material. There'll be times maybe where I ask for um, your input. Uh, and certainly when we're done, I would love to, to have questions and um, have some discussion with you uh, as, as appropriate. Um, how many of you, right, this is northern lower Michigan, the sand dunes up near uh, Sleeping Bear. Uh, how many of you, as you come into college, come into biology, are thinking that this is the type of job you would want, that you would want to be teaching and, and working out someplace like this. What, you would rather be sitting in a chair in a lecture <laughs> listening to me? Is that the idea? <laughs> okay, so none of you right now have that idea. Um, I maybe will try to do a little bit of convincing. Uh, but if not, that's okay. We all have our different um, interests and passions, and I'll, I'll talk some more about that. But this is uh, what we get to do at El So I'm going to mention briefly about what's available at El Sabo, kind of connect that to sort of careers and vocations and calling, and then kind of come back to sort of my story and maybe, again, as an old person, you might be able to learn something from it. Um, going forward. So we'll see how that works at the end when we find out if you have any questions or discussion. Okay, but El Sahabal Institute is uh, a relatively small institute. We only have seven full-time faculty members, but we reach over a um, hundred college students every year, um, several thousand local elementary and middle school and high school students, uh, as well as actually church members. We, we hold retreats in a number of different uh, opportunities uh, but mostly for most college students the way they interact with us is taking college courses so we have 27 different environmentally related college courses that are Spring Arbor courses we have a partnership with Spring Arbor that goes back a long time um, and the agreement is, is that these, this is not like taking a course you know at a, at a community college at Michigan State and transferring it in. These are considered Spring Arbor courses because of the agreement, because of the, the partnership that we have. Um, 
So we want you to learn about God's creation, but even more than that, um, a key principle in, is the community that is developed at El Sabo where we learn about the creator, about God through what he's made. Right? Uh, Romans talks about um, that the invisible qualities of God are made known through what he has made. Right? So we can read about God in his word, but his creation also tells us about his glory and his power um, and what God is like. And so our courses are, again, not like this. Our maximum size is 14 students. Most of it is outside in creation, whether it's out on the ocean looking at sea stars, um, collecting bugs, looking at plants. Um, we want you out. These are long, eight hours a day uh, courses, but you're learning skills and you're out in creation learning about the creator that made that, right? Also, it's about people, right? Making connections, um, meeting new friends from around the country. In addition to Spring Arbor, we work with 50 other uh, Christian colleges and universities around the country and Canada. And so on any given campus, there could be anywhere um, from 30 to 40 different students and faculty uh, and families, for that matter, kids sometimes, um, coming together in the summertime when you're working that hard out in God's creation, sometimes things don't go well. Um, you get wet and muddy uh, and smelly. Um, you come home, you eat with each other anyways, right? You play a game of volleyball or uh, soccer, you study, and you get up and you do it all over again. Um, and so it's a great community building exercise. We want students to meet potential colleagues. These students will go off, a lot of them into environmental careers you will have contacts around the country that will perhaps come in handy in your career or advancing you to a career in the future, as well as meeting faculty from outside of Spring Arbor. So you will get to know a lot of great faculty at Spring Arbor in a very, again, close relationship because you will have uh, small classes here. Um, but when it comes time for that next step into those careers, it helps to have outside recommendations and outside references that can uh, speak to your abilities as well, all right? So we'll come back uh, to that, but El Sabo does that. It's a lot, of, a lot of fun, okay? We do that in terms of the courses through five different locations. Um, so India and Costa Rica are two May session classes. You would just, you, there's one class in each of those. They're, they last three weeks. Uh, India is looking at conservation and development. Uh, India has a huge population. It's a very still rapidly growing population. And so when we think about caring for God's creation, right, part of that creation is people, right? People have a special place because we're the only part of creation that was made in God's image, okay? And so we're to help take care of the rest of creation. We have to um, do that. So when that comes in conflict, when you have these amazing biodiverse tropical forests where elephants and tigers um, live and uh, that's where they are able to survive, and yet you have people that are going hungry or need a place to grow crops, how do you manage that, that competition, right? That's something that we may hear about, we sort of think about, but here you can see it directly, right? What does it mean? to be a poacher and still say that, hey, I'm a Christian, I love God, uh, I follow the laws. Clearly you don't, but if you don't hunt, you don't have food for your family. So it's a very difficult situation. Costa Rica is also a tropical place, very biodiverse. The focus of that class is um, sustainable agriculture and missions. Uh, basically you're working with a missions agency who uh, works with local farmers on sustainable practices to help care for God's creation. And then in the meantime, they use that to share the gospel. Uh, so if you're interested in any type of missions, that's going to involve caring for people and the land that helps them to grow food in a sustainable way. That's a great uh, course to be in. Great Lakes is our main campus. That's what we say to people who are outside of Michigan because believe it or not, people in California don't know where Michigan is on the map. Um, so we talk about the Great Lakes and they have some vague idea that there's lakes um, over here. 
but this is our campus in northern Michigan, so three and a half hours north of here. We have May session courses where, you, again, you can take one class in three weeks, and then we have two summer sessions where you could take two classes in each of those five weeks. So if you were really uh, ambitious, you could take actually five courses in the summer and get 20 credit hours, so more than a semester's worth of credits uh, in one summer. Um, so there's 15 classes. They range from wildlife uh, biology to forest management to lakes, uh, lake ecology, um, GIS courses. There's, there's a bunch of them. I'll, I have some brochures you can take a look at later, but that's our, our main campus. And then Pacific Rim is out on Whidbey Island. It's right in the Puget Sound near Seattle, Washington. And so you live right on the ocean. You look right out through the Puget Sound to the Pacific Ocean for sunsets. And that's where we're able to offer things that we don't have in Michigan, like real mountains, like the Cascades. So you can learn about alpine ecology if you like to go uh, hiking and camping in mountains. Uh, if you like marine life, like that sea star that was in the previous picture, or whales, we have a marine mammals class, a marine biology course. We have sustainable agriculture, um, forest management. There's you're, we're right near the Olympic Peninsula, which has the temperate rainforest, the, the moss-covered trees, the giant banana slugs, um, things like that. So you can take courses out in the Pacific Rim campus. And then I said we have five campuses. That's sort of partially true because um, technically we haven't operated on a fifth campus, but we're going to starting this spring. So in May session of 2020, we're going to offer the same type of intensive courses, but instead of getting out maybe into a, deep into a forest, you're gonna go into this city, okay? More than 50% of the world's population lives in cities right now. It's only growing, um, and yet God's creation is there. And we need to, to have that creation. We need to understand um, how that works in such an intensely human uh, setting. And so we're going to be based out of a, a university there, and study things like environmental law and policy is one of the courses. There's an urban wildlife ecology. So if you've always wanted to study and know more about rats, um, that's a good chance to take that course, okay? But there's more wildlife than just rats in the city, right? There are raccoons, squirrels. I mean, you think about the campus here um, and some of the wildlife that comes on, that wildlife still makes its home in these cities, right? Either in the parks or adapting the human, human presence birds, bird populations, right? Some of our endangered species are restored in part because they nest on skyscrapers now, right? Like the peregrine falcon. So there's a lot of urban wildlife ecology. There's an urban environmental chemistry. If you're, you have sort of a chemistry interest and you want to understand the pollution and the pollutants and how to remediate those, you can take the course here. Uh, and then if you get a little bit away from the, the biology, the science side of things, we have an urban environmental justice. So when we talk about uh, environmental issues, it doesn't affect everyone equally. Some people, some groups, some areas of the world are hit by our environmental pollution uh, much more harshly. And Chicago has been many representatives of that, just like other places around the world. So you can study, study those. Um, so those are the, the courses that we offer. Um, some other opportunities, and I, again, throughout this, this seminar of different people coming in, speakers coming in, um, maybe in other classes, other opportunities on campus, one of the things that I don't want you to be completely overwhelmed with, but I think it's important that you start to understand, is you cannot come into a classroom, sit and take notes, and then just kind of go about your day, and after four years, graduate from Spring Arbor and really expect to get that much further ahead than the thousands of other students at other colleges and universities that do the exact same thing. Okay? One of the key principles I hope you take away from this is you have to figure something a way to set yourself apart. Right? What makes you different? What are the experiences you've had? What are your passions? What are your talents that makes you different than Again, thousands of other students who will be graduating from very similar types of, of majors, at least on paper. If you have a biology major from Spring Arbor or Michigan State 
or University of Michigan, right? What's the difference? Okay, you're going to have to, in some sense, market yourself, sell yourself what makes you different. And so Alsawa tries to do that with our partner colleges, provide extra opportunities that those colleges can. So for example, if you're interested not in just in learning about what's already known, but in making new knowledge and conducting scientific research, we have a couple of opportunities. Um, since you're freshmen, um, the sort of early introduction to research is what we call our super program. That stands for Summer Undergraduate Preparation in Environmental Research. That's a summer where you're actually taking classes and learning through a, a research methods course to conduct research, right? And so it's basically, it would be a semester's worth of classes in one summer, but it gives you background experience in understanding research, carrying out a research project, writing it up, and presenting it to uh, the public audience, okay? Those types of experiences are important to get advanced level research experiences. National Science Foundation, um, National Institutes for the Health, NIH, um, some other big government organizations through universities will offer research experiences for undergraduates. Um, these are paid positions, um, but they're very competitive for students who have a lot of experience and uh, preparation for doing that research. In other words, they're not gonna take a student who basically says, I've had three biology classes, but I've never set foot in a lab and had any, any research experience. They want to see that you have research experience. Just like if you're going to go to a medical school, they want you to have shadowed and spent time in a hospital, right? They don't want you to sit in a classroom, learn about the body, you know, and say, oh, that's cool, I want to be a doctor without ever having had an experience. So the super program provides that. For advanced students, um, we have a competitive research program of our own that is paid, you get a stipend, you get free room and board, and you're working on research projects of local conservation interests. So we actually had two Spring Arbor students two summers ago uh, work on research projects. One was working on oil pad reforestation in Northern Michigan. So we have beautiful forests in Northern Michigan, but almost 50 years ago now, 40 plus years ago, we went through an oil crisis in the United States. Right, before you were born, but um, we, were, we thought we were gonna run out of oil because there was um, issues going on in the Middle East. Right? I know it sounds familiar to things that are happening today, but they started doing a lot of drilling in Northern Michigan has a lot of oil. And so they would come in, cut down uh, about five acres of forest, stick a well down, take the oil out, or if, it, if there was no oil, then they would just move on. And they would leave these patches of forest with the assumption that the forest would just gradually grow in. Okay, but now 30 plus years after some of these have been removed, there's no forest. For some reason, the forest never closed in. So we're doing research with the Michigan DNR to try to figure out what trees, what processes we can do to reforest literally um, thousands and thousands of acres of, of northern Michigan forest. Uh, the other research project, we're working on the endangered Kirtland's warbler. Uh, bird that's found in northern Michigan and working on a river that goes through Traverse City, Michigan that had three dams just removed, um, two in the last two years and then one uh, eight years earlier to completely restore the flow to a natural state. Um, with one small exception, there's a small dam remaining to keep sea lamprey out, but otherwise they've now restored this dam and so the trout and everything are being restored and we were studying the food chain of that, the macroinvertebrates. So that's our research uh, programs and opportunities. We have certification programs, uh, depending on the courses and experiences you have at Spring Arbor as well as El Sabo. El Sabo will certify you in different areas. Again, something that when you're uh, applying for jobs or have on a resume to have an outside source of verification that you know and have some skills. Again, not that you're, just that you've taken classes or that you've uh, gotten a grade, but that you've actually demonstrated skills. Right? I'll just mention it here. It's not strictly education, but if you don't want 
to take a class in the summer, you just want to work, but you like the idea of Northern Michigan, we need people to help run these programs in the summer to help with cooking, help with maintenance, um, help in terms of RAs and, and things of that sort uh, in the Texas. <coughs> And then another opportunity I'll talk a little bit more about at the end is something called the Environmental Leadership Intensive. And this is uh, a semester long program, 15 weeks in the fall, 20 weeks in the spring, where you're on our campus. And a big part of it is working with environmental education, working with uh, local school children, teaching them about uh, caring for God's creation. So I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Okay. I was trying to get to this slide before the people had to leave for me. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. No, I, I knew they were coming up, so um, you guys can share with them, but if you want to get some more information, a couple of things about El Salvador just before you leave tonight. You can either sign in with your email address and I'll send you something so we can connect, or you can just reach me, brian at elsalvador.org, and elsalvador.org on the website slash college. Um, and Professor uh, Steele is our faculty representative, so um, he is sort of our liaison between Spring Harbor and El Salvador, so you can always uh, contact him. Okay, so before I move into a little bit different direction with career preparation, are there any questions um, kind of about where I'm coming from? I wanted you to kind of understand what, what we're doing there. Is this going to be on the quiz? Question, yeah. My job, that's a good question. I didn't say that. Because my job is really just a made up job. I'm an administrator, which means that I do a bunch of nothing to organize things that other people do. But my title is Director of Educational Development. So the nearest thing to that on a campus like this would be, I'm not sure, some, something like a dean um, or a vice president, something like that in this position. We'll get more into that as we go along. Yeah. Have you been to all of those? I have, I have been to the Pacific Rim, to Great Lakes. Um, haven't been to the actual campus of Chicago, but I spend a fair amount of time in Chicago. Uh, again, in Costa Rica, although that, it was before we worked with the people that we're working with now. Um, and I haven't been to India yet. So that's on the to-do list. <laughs> okay, so the next, Next part of this, I want to kind of broaden out our perspective. So not just thinking about El Salvador, especially because when I had a picture on Lake Michigan by the sand dunes, none of you wanted to work in that environment. Um, so clearly you're gonna go probably in some different direction. So I want to just kind of broaden this out. I'm gonna sort of keep it still environmentally focused as I can. Um, but I, I want to make it applicable and get you to think about some things in terms of careers, whether it's in the environmental sciences or in, in really any other area. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not sure what you get in other classes, what other programs you, you may have here. Different colleges do it in different directions. Um, but most of you, I'm suspecting, when you're finished at Spring Arbor, you want to end up in some type of a career, right? You want to be able to have uh, a job where you're working, uh, making income, can support yourself, maybe can pay off loans, um, don't have to live with your parents, you know, whatever that, that is. And so that career is, is important. Um, I subtitled this Purposeful Development and Career Preparation. One, right, purposeful. This is something, again, I want to impress on you, even as freshmen in your first few weeks of college. You have to be thinking about your future now and making some intentional choices. It doesn't have to be a stressful thing, right? You are not going out to get a job tomorrow, but you need to start thinking about it and it can help um, prepare you in a long way. So I wanna share some ideas about how to do that, okay? 
Now, when I talk about careers, and depending on your background or interest, or, or maybe programs here at uh, Spring Arbor, there are different terms for this, right? If you look up in the dictionary, you may have heard or heard people talk about the term vocation, right? Or especially in a Christian context, we often talk about our calling, right? As some type of a spiritual direction towards whatever career or vocation we're going into. Um, so career, vocation, calling, kind of, in some senses, all run together. Right? You may have heard them, you may not really know the difference between them. Um, I guess I would tell you the short answer is I don't think there's a huge difference between them. Um, they, they, they do run together. This is a definition I've seen before um, called vocational calling. So they combine these things together because they don't even, <laughs> they don't want to make a distinction. Is the call to God and to serve and to his service in your vocation? You know, if, if I ask on a quiz, um, define vocation and calling or something like that, like I would probably fail you if you wrote this. This, this is like a circular argument. I mean, we're vocational calling, it's the call to God and serve in your vocation. Yeah, duh. I mean, how does that help me understand anything, right? Does that, does that clarify anything for you? Because it doesn't for me, and supposedly I've had a lot of education. So, so let's just break that down a little bit. The way that I interpret this and the difference between these is that vocation can kind of be associated with calling and career depending on who you talk to and in the context. So some places, when you talk about what is your vocation, that will mean the exact same as, as a career, all right? Um, I'm a, a biology professor, that's my vocation, that's my career. Um, I'm a veterinarian, that's my vocation, that's my career, right? Um, calling, again, as I mentioned, tends to have more of a spiritual dynamic, something outside of ourself almost, calling us into that. Um, and so calling, if, if you were to say, I am called of God to be a missionary to Rwanda, right? Now, you may be called by God. You may have had a moment where God struck you and it was as clear as day that that is what you're called to, um, like some of the well-known names in the Bible, right? Most people, when they say, I'm called by God to do something, don't necessarily have that um, moment. But they have this sense as they've grown up that this is something I'm to do, that I feel like God is calling me to. It's not that they've um, actually uh, heard it in an audible voice or some other way. So calling can be this super spiritual, yes, definitely called, or it can be this feeling that you're being led towards a certain career, but instead of calling it a career, which just is sort of a human term, we call it a vocation. So you kind of get these towards this end. And then career, again, you're a dump truck driver, a cashier, a veterinarian, a doctor, right? There's that's just something you do, but do you really like it? Is it something that fits your passions and interests? Is it something that maybe God is calling you to? And so as you start getting into those questions, it leads into that, that vocation, okay? That's all, I probably shouldn't spend that much time on it. I'm just saying those can all be sort of used interchangeably, but there is sort of a gradient, at least in the way that I see that. Now, the good news is, is that if you go to certain websites, this one, I don't even remember what the letters stand for, it's something about work in economics.org, but they tell us that discovering our vocation is possible. So in other words, if you're not sure exactly what your vocation, slash career, slash calling is, as a freshman at Spring Harbor, right, that's okay, because you can discover your vocation, right, because vocation, is something based on giftedness or talents, interests, passions, and human needs, which are all easy to identify. Okay. How many of you feel like you know exactly where God is calling you, what your vocation is gonna be in four years when you graduate from Spring Arbor? Okay, what do you, what is that? Uh, to go to another college. To go to another, for, grad, for another degree. Okay, in what? 
in neuroscience? Yeah. Okay. Veterinarian. Okay, a veterinarian. Anesthesiology. Okay, so three, so it's less than about a quarter of us, right? So it was fairly easy for you guys, right? Um, for the rest of us, maybe not so easy. And I'm here to tell you that pushing 50 years old is not easy, hasn't been easy for me. I'm still not sure I have it solved, okay? So I kind of find that somewhat humorous, um, but certainly there are people that from a very young age know what they want to do um, and will go do it. Now, I would also tell you that from a young age, I was going to be a scientist. And that was as early as I can remember. Of course, my first thing was I was going to cure headaches because I suffered from bad headaches, but I never ended up going into medicine. So you can, you know, you will see what, um, what happens with that, but you can certainly from a young age know what that is. I would just argue it's not always so easy to identify. Okay, now, when you find your giftedness, your interest, your passions, where it meets a human need perhaps, um, and again, I don't know that everyone would say that it has to meet a human need. Some people would, could care less, perhaps. Um, but you may find that, right? A lot of times you'll see that type of a process, that type of um, answer laid out in a mission statement, okay? Now, of course, I'm thinking mostly of businesses and organizations that have mission statements, okay? But I would challenge you, especially those of you who already know where you're going, and those of you who don't, it's okay, you can still craft a mission statement. Think about what your mission is at this point, with the understanding that you may not be entirely certain and it may change. But mission statements are good ways to get into words what is your giftedness, your interests, your passions, how do they meet human need, um, and lead towards a vocation, okay? So for Alsable, so I'm gonna, again, tie this back to Alsable, um, our mission statement is to inspire and educate people to serve, protect, and restore God's earth, right? Simple statements, you can remember it. Um, our executive director at Every once in a while, I mean, he'll just call on us. It's like, Brian, what's, uh, what's our mission statement? We have to recite it. Um, if you come to Al Sabal and you're a student at various points, um, he will ask you uh, as a group, he doesn't call out the students individually, right? What is the mission statement, right? The mission statement is important because it identifies what direction you're going, what is your vocation um, and your calling uh, to service. And so this is our uh, mission statement along the bottom. It comes from Genesis 2.15, right? So as a Christian Environmental Institute, um, we believe firmly in Genesis 1, not getting into all the details about time and days and stuff, but Genesis 1 clearly states that God created, right? He made everything, right? And even before day six when he made humans, he said it was good. And that translation in English is sometimes translated, he delighted in it, right? So he made it, he delighted in it. It had nothing to do with the fact that it might have been good food for us or beautiful for us to look at. It was beautiful for him, right? Just like when you're writing up a, a research paper, a term paper for a class, right? And you agonize over every single word, make sure it's perfectly written, meets the 500 word um, amount, meets whatever criteria, and you say, this is a beautiful piece of work, work of art, right? And then your roommate comes in and throws it in the garbage and stomps on it, right? You're upset. You, you spent time, you delighted in your creation. Um, it's not something that you want to go to waste. And so God delighted in his creation, he gave humans a special mission, right? Because we're created in his image above all other uh, organisms. And that, the first statement in the Bible of what that mission, part of what that is, is in Genesis 2.15. It talks about taking the man, placing him in the Garden of Eden, which was creation, right? With all the trees and the animals and everything. And he said, to abide in Shemarit. Okay? In most English translations, those Hebrew words, which is, what the Bible was written in, are translated something along the lines of tilling the ground, 
maybe just watching over the that creation kind of oh it's it's enjoyable to, to look at okay but if we look a little further into that um, those words in other places in the Bible are used in a much more sort of forceful and um, different uh, context so that word abad means to serve God right? it's literally a service to God so Joshua 24 15 anyone know a verse in Joshua that talks about serving God Choose this day whom you will abide. As for me and my household, we will abide the Lord. Right? It's that same word. Clearly talking about that we are going to do something for the Lord that is unique, that's different from the rest of the world. So to serve, that's where we get the serve part of our uh, mission. And then to shamar it. Again, shamar does mean watch over, but in other places in the Bible, it's much more forceful protect or defend against harm, right? And in some contexts, that's protecting against enemies, like when the Israelites are um, out in the wilderness and, and they're coming up against enemies in different places. Uh, but it also, in Numbers, the Levites are the special group of the Israelites that are uh, tasked with caring for God's temple and um, the religious sort of aspect of it. And so... That shamar means to basically actively defend a sacred space. So treating God's creation, right, as a sacred, as a holy place. It's something he made. It's something that he delighted in. So that's where we get the, the, our mission to inspire and educate people to serve, protect God's earth. Okay? Now, this idea of vocation, calling, mission, right, one of the sort of good summaries you'll, you'll see again, if you search for vocation and calling or Christian vocation, um, Frederick Buechner um, is, was a writer, again, touched on a number of different theological topics, uh, but he had a, a way with words. And so the way he sort of described this idea is that it's the place God calls you, the, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. So what is your vocation, your calling, your career goal? The place, everyone's going to be different, right? But the place that God calls you to is a place where your deep gladness, so I'm assuming there's something about animals, right, that we care about, and the world's deep hunger meet, caring for those animals. Okay. Now, I come from an environmental institute, and I am Christian, and when I tell People, sometimes Christians, sometimes uh, non-Christians that I met at a Christian environmental institute, sometimes, again, their jaw sort of drops. They're like, how can you be a Christian and care for the environment? It's just going to burn in the end anyways. God's given us the world to do as we want. We can do whatever with it. Um, as long as it helps people, it doesn't hurt people, right? So, again, this is, I talked about the India course. We can burn down forests because we have to plant for food. It's all right to kill off all of that biodiversity. And I don't have all the answers, but um, it's clear that God made creation and he delighted in it, and he's given us the opportunity to serve and protect it. Um, so I think God does care about things other than people. Right? He cares about those plants and animals and snails, that's one of my favorites, um, as, as well as humans. And so one of the things when you look at something like this, talks about where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. A lot of people will translate that, think of that world, talking about where the world's people and their deep hunger meet. Right? How many of you, if I asked you to sort of talk about what's the world's deep hunger, would have related it to people? Right? Yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's a typical kind of thing. But I, I just want you to think about something when we look at uh, some Bible verses. Where uh, in the Bible, again, I know this is a quiz and you don't have to answer, this isn't, isn't graded, but when we talk about God's care or concern for the world, what's a verse that might pop into your mind about the world? For God so loved the world he gave his one only son. 
Yeah. Right? John 3.16. It's almost like I could imagine that you had heard that verse before. Right? I use the King James Version just because it's um, something that I grew up with and has that more poetic language. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, that world world. Right? For God so loved all the people that he gave his begotten son. No, it's it's world. That in Greek is cosmos. It means everything that God made. The heavens and the earth, the people, right? It's everything. Okay? And so I just kind of want you, I'm gonna you come back to this Frederick Buechner quote again. When you're thinking about where is your deep gladness and where does the world's deep hunger meet? That world is a big place. So I don't want you to feel like if you don't care, you know, if your career, your vocation is not to care for the um, hungry, the poor, you know, the sick, it's okay to have a care and meet the world's great need someplace else because God cares about everything, right? He sent his son to die for that. Now, Right? He had to send his son right, because of sin. Right? We have not served and protected God's earth. We have not cared for the world as a whole. That's where this restoration comes from. We also want to help restore God's earth. And again, some people will point to certain verses, and I'm not going to get into that big discussion, but with this idea that the earth is just going to be wiped out and it doesn't matter what we do. Okay, um, Colossians 1.20 is one of the verses that would suggest otherwise. Right? Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace... Oh, I was going to see if anyone knew Colossians 1.20. Okay. I figured you would, so I just jumped ahead. Right? Having made peace through the blood of his cross, right? for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? through his blood on the cross, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Again, that word all things is a Greek word that implies everything. Again, it's, I am not just reconciling people unto himself. Right? But if you ask, why did Jesus come to die? Right? To save sinners. To save me. Okay? That's part of it. But there's more. So, when you talk about the world's deep hunger, I think it's okay to broaden that out and to be okay if you care for the dogs and the cats, right? If you care for the snails and the rivers, if you care for the heavens, the moon and the stars, you want to be an astrophysicist, right? right. So, how do we get to this point where we figure out where our passions, our deep gladness, the deep hunger of the world meet. And so I'm going to go through this. I'm not, this is not uh, a whole seminar, a how-to, a career development seminar. But one of the first things, you go back to Socrates or Plato or other ancient people, they talk about this idea of know thyself. Right? Sounds fancy and philosophical. Um, but it, it really is true. As you're here, Right? As you take different classes, how many of you are taking a class this semester that you don't necessarily really want to take? Okay. I'm not going to ask you to name which one it is, because it may be this one that I feel hurt. Um, okay, but that's part of a liberal arts education, part of a broad, comprehensive school. You take things that maybe um, aren't your first love, but and sometimes you'll find out, yeah, there's a reason I didn't want to take calculus. There's a reason I didn't want to take physics. There's a reason I didn't want to take uh, British literature. Um, but sometimes you'll discover actually that there are things in those classes that bring you gladness. And so sometimes trying new things is not a bad thing. You want to figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are. If you take a calculus class and you can't tell the difference between an integral and you know anything else, probably not one of your strengths, maybe you should stay away from it. So knowing yourself, starting to understand this, and this is hard, okay? Um, you have grown up with a family 
most likely. You have grown up with friends. You have grown up with teachers, right, that have known you. You have grown up maybe with pastors, youth group leaders, right? And they've all had some influence on you. But um, for many of you, you maybe have grown up in similar surroundings for most of your life. And now you're here in a different place. And you're like, and maybe some of you were intentional about this, I'm going to become someone different at Spring Arbor. Like, I felt like I had to fit in. I felt like I had to do something uh, here at home. But I am now on my own. I'm going to become an adult. Do you guys use the word adulting? Are you adulting right now? Um, crazy words, okay? But it, it's hard. It's not easy to figure out who you are when you're surrounded by all sorts of influences. So I want you to take some time and start thinking about that. There's a, a number of different ways. Um, I'm going to take one of these and we'll get to this in just a second. I should say one. Pass them out. Okay, so there are different ways to know this. Again, one, you can sit and think and ponder this yourself, um, and that can certainly work. But like I said, you're sort of biased and influenced sometimes by your, your surroundings, how you were brought up, the people that influence you. So there are different uh, tools and techniques out there. Anyone know what Myers-Briggs is? Personality test, so if you've heard talk like I'm an introvert or an extrovert or a feeler or a sensor. Um, there's, there's different categories. That's one of these personality tests. But those personalities tell us something about how we interact with the world, right? How, um, I'm, I'm actually an introvert for those of you who care to know. Like, I mean, this doesn't completely terrify me <laughs> being up front, but this drains me. Like, I will be glad to get in the car and sort of have some downtime on my drive home, okay? I don't mind doing this, but it, this is not something that energizes me. Extroverts, my wife is an extrovert. Like, she, this energizes her. She loves to be up in front of people talking, okay? So those personalities don't be, define us, but they provide some idea of why we might be different, why we might have a strength in one area, and, it, and others have a strength in a different area. So Myers-Briggs is one of those. You can find sort of online versions, but there are actually scientific um, study ones. You have to pay for them and go to psychologists and stuff, but um, they're out there. Strength Finders is another group that has put together sort of a questionnaire to help you determine your strengths. Um, and they, they actually make one that's specific for students. So the questions and um, the way that they describe the different strengths that you develop or that you can have um, are geared more towards students of, of your age. Um, Enneagram, at least to me, is a fairly new one, but it, apparently it's been around for a long time. Anyone heard of Enneagrams? Okay, a few of you. So Enneagram, in some ways it's like a, a Myers-Briggs. They Enneagram breaks you down into nine different types, and you have these subtypes and wings and, and stuff. Um, the Enneagram, though, has a lot built into it about how you can grow, how you can change, right? Myers-Briggs tends to say, you're an introvert or an extrovert, and that's sort of how you're born and that's how you're going to stay. Um, Enneagram suggests at least that there's a way to grow and, and to change. Um, all of these, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you do them. I'm just saying that they're out there. If you come across them, if you really uh, need help and want to do some of this, those are some, some options that are, are out there. Um, the fourth one that's up there is a transferable skill survey. And I handed one of these out. Did everyone get one? Um, again, if you go online and Google, this is something that you, you shouldn't have to pay for because it's all over the place out there. There's, and there's different ones. There's no one right one. But if you look at the top of this, this you can see this is actually geared towards a senior student, right? college student. Over the years, you've developed many skills from coursework, co-curricular activities, right? You're supposed to get involved in sports or music or whatever. Those are co-curricular activities. And your total life experiences. If you've researched topics, written reports, edited, presented papers, you've used skills that are not limited to one discipline, but are transferable to many different occupations, careers, or disciplines. A prospective employer expects you to be able to apply the skills you learned in college 
right, to the work environment. Use the following checklist to help you pinpoint some of your transferable skills. Right? So, I mean, they're giving this to the seniors, which works, but what I want you to point out is that this is what's coming down the pipeline for you when you're a senior. Thinking about what skills did you have, not just what classes did you sit in, right, and text your friend on your phone, right, sleep, think about whatever's happening next. They want to know what skills you have and how can that skill be applied to the job that you're applying to or the graduate school that you're trying to get into. Okay, this is probably the most comprehensive list I've seen, so um, I'm a little overwhelmed just giving it to you. I'm a little nervous doing that, but I think it just to give you an idea of, of what's out there, um, notice how they break it into categories. They break it into communication skills. Almost every time you talk about what people want out of college graduates, something has to do with being good communicators. Written, oral, uh, presenting those types of skills. Research, planning, investigation. Right? That's another one. Being able to dig into something, to find information, to analyze data, things of that sort. Okay? Again, this, you may not have strengths here. Um, you may not have skills that can transfer, but you, you might have some. And other ones you can start to work on. If, if you are thinking about a career that requires this, and you know that you're not strong in it, you can start to develop some of these skills. That's why I'm kind of presenting this to you as, as freshmen instead of seniors getting ready to go into the, the next step. Uh, human relations and interpersonal. Again, this is a big one, right? Most every job you're going to do is going to deal with humans. Whether you're going to have to deal with your boss, coworkers, whether you're going to be the boss and have to deal with your employees, whether you're gonna to have to deal with the bankers and the um, accountants that are telling you that you don't have enough money for what you want to do, I mean, you're going to be interacting. So that human relations, interpersonal skills are important, right? Work survival, showing up on time, right? Cooperating, managing time and stress, attending to detail, working effectively under pressure, okay? I mean, these are just things that come with any job. And so you, sometimes you're gonna get stressed, right? You have three exams on Friday. Um, how do you budget your time? How do you deal with that stress? I mean, that's actually a skill, and that's why some people don't graduate college. You're learning skills, but you need to think about that. Those, what are you strong in, and what will you need to work on as you go through your four years, okay? The back page, organization management leadership, right? So if you're going to go into a position where you're expected to take and make decisions, have you developed that um, as a student? Have you joined clubs or organizations? Have you become officers in those clubs? Um, when you're working maybe in a, a group in a lab, maybe you're uh, in a small group, right? Do you tend to take the lead or do you just sort of sit off to the side and let everyone else do the work, okay? Again, not no one's gonna say, yes, I'm good at all of these, but, but you can see some ideas, right? Financial management, critical thinking, problem solving. Now, this particular list, again, is geared towards seniors, basically saying, identify your top five skills, write examples, um, and kind of prepare a, a cover letter, a resume based around that, right? That certainly will work. Um, other examples I've seen of similar sets say to basically just go through and rank each of these sub-skills. Am I strong in it? Am I okay? Do I need some help? Right? That's one, one option. I would go even further with that, not as a freshman here, but maybe at the end of each of your years. Um, find someone you trust that knows you, and you give them that same list and have them rank you on those same skills and find out where you think you're strong, they maybe think you need some help, right? That's where, again, knowing yourself, sometimes we can fool ourselves. Sometimes we can think we're great at analyzing or making decisions when our friends or um, teachers or parents or others may like you, wishy-washy, couldn't make a decision if your life depended on it, right? So um, just giving you some ideas, but 
it's important to spend some time thinking about that, knowing yourself, what is your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what do you need to work on, um, and so forth. How do you approach different things? Okay. Now, just related to that I mentioned, ask someone, get some help on, on ranking things. While you're here at Spring Arbor and any time in life, seek mentors, right? Seek older, wiser mentors that can help you through this. This could be someone from home. You can have mentors for different aspects of your life, um, but, but seek mentors. When you're seeking these, what you want are people that are going to be honest with you. So again, sometimes grandma is not the best mentor because she's always going to love you and say you're perfect um, and it'll, it'll all work out all right all the time, right? That's not really true. So find someone who's going to be honest Right? Find someone who's sharing. Right? You don't want someone who isn't going to want to take an interest and sort of spend time and share their life and your life uh, together. They, they need to be someone that is able to open and share with you. Someone who's a listener, right? because they, they need to hear from you and get to understand who you are. And then I like this idea of being a continuous learner. Okay? Your mentor, a good mentor, probably is not someone who is like the expert in their field and thinks they know everything. Um, you know, Sheldon Cooper, if you watch Big Bang Theory, I mean, he would not be a good mentor because he knows it, you don't, you're stupid, right? It should be someone who thinks that they can always learn, that they can learn from you, you can learn from them, that life is better if you're sort of continuously learning and expanding and growing uh, because they're going to help you to do the same same thing, okay? Um, other things when I look at uh, mentors and how to find good mentors and what mentors are, I, this works sometimes, but the, the, uh, the, the basis actually for the term mentor is to seek someone that you want to emulate, okay? Again, not necessarily that you want to become that person, but if you have a professor you have, again, someone at your church, someone in a profession somewhere um, that you are able to get to know as a mentor. Um, if there's someone that you want to emulate, that you, you see how they react uh, to a stressful situation and say, I want to be like that. Like, I would have blown my top, and yet they were able to sort of calm things down. Um, you want to be able to emulate them. So, so think carefully uh, about those. And if you find a good mentor, um, they're worth gold. Uh, not, not everyone, not every career position, you're going to be able to do that. And that's why you may have multiple ones. You know you go to someone with, for this area, you go to someone for a, a different area. Okay. Third thing, again, I would just say challenge yourself. Right? Practice being outside your comfort zone. Okay. And I say that, and I, and I told you, I'm an introvert. I am not naturally a public speaker. Um, Everyone's, you know, it's like, well, just get out there and practice. The more you practice. It's like, I, I, I was a professor for 15 years. I was up in front of students every day. I mean, it's still, if I do something different, some, you know, sometimes I get nervous, anxious, I'm worried about it. Are they going to listen to me? Do they care? Right? All those things going through your head. Um, it doesn't always work. It doesn't always make you, like, the most comfortable, non-anxious person. So, but you can practice it. If it's important to you, you, you have to kind of push yourself on it, right? Now, if getting up in front of people or um, working on, someone wanted to do neuroscience, right? I, I'm not sure what area of neuroscience, but like if cutting open a skull to get to the brain to study it like really grosses you out, um, and you know, you try cutting open a frog first, and you sort of make it through and then you get to like a cat, right? And then you go to med school and you have to do it on a person and like, I mean, you just literally can't go in the room. I mean, you can practice it, but maybe you're just not gonna get it, right? I mean, and, and we live, this, this world, is, there's a lot of anxiety, so I'm not saying to like stress yourself out over a thing, but sometimes you, you do need to understand that being a little outside your comfort zone is important and you can practice that you'll get through it, okay? Number four, diversity of experience. I already sort of mentioned this. You could not just come to college and sit in classes and expect to sort of make, make a difference. You need to get involved in different groups, 
seek out internships, um, whether they're short-term, long-term, paid or unpaid. Uh, study abroad is a good way to uh, get some experience. Um, study abroad for some students means going to like some foreign country to kind of party or, or whatever that is, and that, that can be the case for some students. But hopefully for you, it would be going to experience a new culture, to maybe understand what it's like to be a minority or not be able to fully speak a language in the culture, uh, to understand what it's like um, to just think of the world outside of the lens of Spring Arbor or Michigan or the United States or whatever area you're from. Um, that's, it's a big deal and it's, it's hard to get abroad. You have a lot of red tape, forms, things. So it, it, it gives you transferable skills other than just the experience. Right? Volunteer. So seek diversity of experiences. Okay? And then the fifth and final one here is to make things happen. Okay? Another way of saying that is be proactive. Don't just wait for it to fall in your lap. Right? If you have questions about something, go get answers. Right? If something is important, Right? Adjust your schedule, do something about it. Don't just sort of say, well, I was hoping it was gonna happen, but it just fell through. You have to take initiative, be proactive. Um, there, again, there's just too much competition. There's too, too many opportunities out there that will pass you by if you're thinking that it's gonna hit you on the head with it. So be proactive um, and Make, make things happen. Now, I'm gonna briefly tell you my story. Um, I've shared bits and pieces of it, but again, part of this I want you to understand. I am not perfect in all of these things. I am a human being, I'm a sinner, right? I am made differently than you are. You're made differently than your neighbors. I mean, you may have a twin sibling that you're different from. Um, we are all different, but I, I want to kind of give you a story, throw in a little bit more information, just so maybe you can see yourself somewhere down the road um, in some of this, okay? But let me just go back to this idea of serving, protecting, right? Serving God, right? Enjoy, right? Deep gladness is what Beginner called it. Okay? And then finding out where that world's need is. Right? This idea of um, protecting, of shamaring God's creation, whether it's people or otherwise. Okay? Where do your interests line up with that? So I'm here from El Salvador Institute of Environmental Studies. Right? I'm not here from University of Michigan Medical School from Duke Divinity School, um, whatever else, right? So clearly you know somewhere along the lines where my passions were, right? And so again, I want you to start thinking about this. You're much younger than me, but you've already had experiences that have led some of you already very directly to what your interests are, okay? My interests started out young, right? Um, I would spend a lot of time outside riding bikes, digging holes in the ground and calling them forts, building tree forts if we wanted to bang hammers on things. Um, I like being outside, okay? My time as a kid was when computers were just starting to come out in terms of a sense that you could have a computer at home, okay? So I got into that, like I, I, I was a programmer in BASIC, like one of the, the earliest languages. Um, but mostly I like to spend time outside. So my family, we didn't, you know, we didn't travel much. We stayed mostly in Michigan, but one year we were able to um, go down to Disney World. It was my first time ever traveling down to Florida. Um, we went to Disney World. How many of you have been to Disney World? Okay, so, I mean, you might like the princesses or, you know, I don't know, whatever's there, there now. But just to tell you how much of a sort of a science nerd it was, I spent a day, instead of going to Disney World, going on like a little class that they had through Epcot Center 
to learn about the nature of Disney World. So we got to go behind the scenes and see like the swamps where the alligators live. We got a book with birds in it and stuff like that. Um, while my brothers and family were riding roller coasters or doing whatever, but I loved it, okay? And one of the birds that I saw was this bird here, which is a dusky seaside sparrow. A fairly nondescript little sparrow. It lived on the barrier islands of Florida, on the coast of Florida. Hey, I got to see it because Disney World and Epcot Center, Epcot Center had just opened, um, had the last three individuals of the Dusky Seaside Sparrow in captivity, and they were all males. And so by 1990, I, would, I visited there in 1984, six years later, the last of those had died, right? God's creation died. He delighted it, and we killed it off because we wanted to build houses on those islands, right? That... I can still remember seeing those birds today. That stuck in me. You can hear me getting passionate about it. Okay? I got to college. I went to uh, Hope College. So, other side of the state. I was from, I'm from Grand Rapids originally. I had the opportunity to join a faculty member in research and go down to Costa Rica. And Costa Rica to a, a small place. I, I told you about our location for El Sabo. Um, but where I stayed was at a small town called Monte Verde, basically a mountaintop. And four square miles of that mountaintop, it was protected because um, the people that settled there wanted to protect their watershed. They wanted to protect their, their clean water. Um, the year before I went down there was the last time they had seen this uh, golden toad, El Bufo Dorado. Um, and so I was like, this was exciting. I was like, maybe I'm going to be the one to find one of the small populations and, and sort of continue this on. But I never saw it. No one ever saw it. In 2004, finally, they declared it extinct. Okay, so I never did get to see it, but I was walking the ground where this used to live. That, that stuck me. Okay, Galapagos tortoise. This is Lonesome George. He's a Pinta Island tortoise from one of the islands. They all have different shaped shells or, or different species. Um, again, I was able, uh, fortunately, to go down to Ecuador as a student. And I've taken students there, so I've actually seen Lonesome George three times. Um, the last time in 2009, um, but 2012, George died. The last of his species, right? Killed off because in the 1860s, we just took hundreds of these at a time and kill them just for sport and then for meat to carry on ships. Um, but there are no more uh, Pinta Island uh, tortoises. A okay. little bit closer to home, uh, one of my interests, I heard someone talking about pollinators. I love uh, insects and bugs. Um, rusty pet bumblebee, right? It's not extinct yet in the United States. There are a few populations remaining in other states. But in Michigan, the last rusty pet bumblebee was seen in 1992 so um, we have an impact on God's creation and, and I don't like the fact <laughs> that these things that most people consider insignificant um, I have a passion for and and they're going extinct so I very much very early on was like I, I had no interest in medical stuff um, I tried at some point I was an EMT um, had to do you know a fair number of medical procedures uh, but I, I didn't spend much time in that for long because I, I really, my passion was working with these types of, of critters. So just very quickly, I, I just sat down and I said, what does my life look like? Because I was a kid who pretty much knew that he liked biology and ecology, lakes and bugs and critters from a, a young age. Okay, so here's... Thinking back to high school, when I, I really had that understanding. What were my careers? What were my vocations? These are somewhat in order, right? But I had a job as a rug cleaner, right? Those little rugs at the entryway, we'd put them through a machine and, and, and clean them. I was a janitor. I worked on a factory assembly line. Of course, I was a college student, right? That's a career. Um, I was a researcher, teaching, teaching assistant, graduate student, lab coordinator, research assistant, Instructor, parasitologist, I love parasites, right? Tapeworms, and I'm like, oh, I wish I could have one, right? Because for most people, right, they actually don't cause as much harm as we think, right? Malnutrition and other issues compounded with parasites, bad stuff for humans. But in many cases, parasites are actually indicators of health. 
right? If you go out into a pond and you have a bunch of bass and so forth, you catch those bass and they have no tapeworms in their gut, that's a bad ecosystem because those tapeworms, if they were there, they would indicate that there's a food web that is healthy down the line. Okay, so I got into parasites. That was a fun thing. I still get to do a little bit with that. Again, I was a professor. Um, while I was at my previous position before El Salvo, I've been at El Salvo for three years. I helped with assessment. I helped start public health uh, things. I was a forensic entomologist. Who knows what a forensic entomologist is? Thinking about careers in biology? What is it? Is that like dead bugs or bugs and dead bodies? Or yeah, something? bugs and dead bodies. Like, I got to put out pigs and let them rot and fill with maggots um, and then bring students out and say, hey, you gotta collect those and identify them and tell me how long ago that pig died, right? Tell me um, what you can tell about, did they have any injuries, right? Um, I loved it. I mean, not really so much about the pig, but it was like, there were these maggots and then you could grow them up and they turn into these beautiful blue and green metallic flies and, could look at the little hairs on their heads and their, their thorax and identify the different species. Um, God's creation, right? I, I love those types of things. Now the forensic students wanted to go on and become forensic scientists and work for the crime lab and stuff like that. Um, I got to teach it, that was great, but I really, what I cared about were the maggots um, and, the, and the flies and the beetles. Um, where are we at? Oh, honor society, so we were trying to bring an honor society into I worked with our engineering and technology programs there to find new ways to work. I got to be a marine biologist. Every, I, I never really had that dream, but they needed someone to teach marine biology. And so I went for 10 years to Florida, got to wade around in the water, catch crabs and giant snails that were this big and 15 pounds, um, sharks, right? I got to almost lose a student who drifted off <laughs> we almost lost her but we found her just before she was getting too tired um took students to the galapagos had students stung by bees in the middle of the jungle we got caught in riots in the middle of the jungle and had to be basically literally smuggled out of the jungle through tear gas and fires in the street um that wasn't up here <laughs> uh university reaccreditation i was a study abroad director uh, assistant Vice President for Economic Affairs. Right now I get to work on invasive species in the river up in northern Michigan, trying to understand the impacts on that river in addition to the dams. And then again, going back to what my official title is, I'm Director of Educational Development, which means I help any of you or others that are involved in education at, at El Sabo, okay? I had no clue I was gonna do any of this stuff when I was in high school, when I first saw that dusky seaside sparrow at Disney World. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of you don't know exactly where you're gonna end up, um, even those of you who have better clues than others. Because again, I, I did have this idea I was gonna be a scientist. I just had no clue what it would look like, okay? But I want you, when you're thinking about this and you're planning for your careers, thinking of El Salvo's mission, thinking of this to serve and protect and restore for his glory, right? That service to God, that protection of sacred spaces, right? Being that priestly duty and, and re helping to restore, whether again, it is that nerve, those nerves that aren't working, those animals that aren't healthy, right? Someone who's in surgery and needs anesthesia, um, whether it is that bug that's crossing the road that you don't step on because you realize it's God's creation and he enjoys it. Um, keep that in mind. You're, you're doing this uh, in service uh, to God. So to get to where I'm wrapping up, and um, I wanted to come back to this. I already talked about this. But at some point down the road, one of the things, we developed this environmental leadership intensive for exactly the reason I'm here today excited to talk to you as freshmen, because we have so many students that come to El Sabo or know about El Sabo and graduate from college and don't know what they want to do yet, right? Um, sometimes it's they just completely never had a clue. Sometimes maybe God did something that changed their mind and now they're unsure. Um, 
But that's what we do. We, we spend a lot on this leadership development in this program. And that's, that's where um, we're having, again, a lot of excitement with the interns that come for this intensive. It's 15 weeks in the fall. It's uh, 20 weeks in the spring. Again, it is something that involves environmental education working with little kids. So I, wa I just want to show you a little snippet of that and I'll, I'll come back to this, but this is just kind of fun because you're tired of listening to me. I'm almost done, but we need a little bit more. So let's do this. Yeah, And what are you doing today? Uh, we're planting plants at the Boardman River. And, and uh, wait, wait, as you can see, the river is right here. What are we doing today? What are you doing right now? We're planting at the Boardman River. What are we putting in? Uh, plants. A thousand plants. Why are we planting on the line of the Boardman? Uh, because it's 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 there. So what's the biggest thing you learned to um, raise? How native plants, or how non-native plants can affect the native plants. Because the invasive plants can harm like our soil and harm just how our natural earth is. Uh, natural like services and stuff that we get, like medicine, um, natural beauty, stuff like that. Cool, so those uh, ecosystem services. Yeah. What watershed are you part of? Do you remember? Uh, we're part of the Mill Creek watershed and Elk Al Lake watershed, Great Lakes watershed, and we're really part of like the, well, yeah, we're part of like, like Michigan and stuff like that. What was your favorite part of race? Um, the planting that we're doing right now. What we're doing right now? Cool. And so tell me about what we did today. So what we did, we planted a thousand native plants around our pond and we planted them, mulch, we're mulching them, and we're weeding. And what did you think of the program? I think the program was amazing because it helped me learn a lot of environmental skills and uh, things that help the environment and stay outdoors much longer and help uh, people and uh, living things outdoors is like worth it. Like you, if like you do good things to it, it'll help save like earth. Anything else you want to say? students help lead those programs um, okay how many of you thought that looked exciting okay a few of you how many of you would never ever do that in a million years okay at least one right so I mean part of that is some of you look at that and see those kids um, and love kids um, some of you like and myself might see like those two little boys at the end just talking over how would you ever get anything done? They would frustrate me. I would, I would lose my cool with them. Right? We have different passions. We have different interests. Um, but something like this, if you have an interest in kids, in some education, 
you are going to be forced to get up in front every day and lead a group of 20 to 25 students. Their parents, the chaperones and teacher will be standing in the back, right? And you're gonna have to, to lead them. Try not, you know, if they're running off after the chipmunk over here, or the snake over there, try to keep them focused on that project. Right? Those are skills that are transferable that you will get practice on. Um, so opportunities like that um, are what you want to think about as you prepare and go forward. Those are something, again, junior, seniors, or, or graduates, we have at El Sable. But I just, I wanna point out that, right? Notice that about yourself. When you saw those little kids, did you have that gladness in your heart, right? Or was that a terrifying, no way, right? So you need to know yourself. You need to understand that, okay? And so, again, kind of just continuing on with that, right? I modified Beekner's. I'm no Frederick Beekner, but just to kind of tie in with the idea of serving God. Um, the place God calls you to is a place in this world. And again, remember, world is everything. So it doesn't have to be a poor dying baby, right? It can be a maggot, right? It can be a plant on the Boardman River. Right? But it's this place in the world where you find joy in serving him, where there is a gladness in your heart, and where that sacred needs protecting, which in this world is just about every place with the sin that's in it um, and the problems we have. So I want you to think about that. Again, you'll have other speakers, other disciplines. Who knows what else coming up? Um, maybe nothing like this. Maybe everything's like this. But think about where you find joy what needs God wants you uh, to protect, and then make it happen, right? Wild snail, off to make it happen. Is it cool? So, all right, that's all I have. I would love to hear any questions, any thoughts about your careers, things that, that you had, um, things I said that you're like, that was stupid, don't use that again. Um, that, that didn't work for me, but this did. particular one are they plant about 20 different species so um, some grasses again some flowers um, but they're all perennial native wildflowers so um, asters okay. right I am going to again whatever you need to do for the rest of this I'll gladly but I have a sign-up sheet.